he came through the door, just banged the door right open. And from the moment he approached the adults first and he walked towards me and started shooting. And it never stopped for the next three minutes, three and a half minutes of carnage. He was carrying 743 rounds of ammunition. School had a roll of about 700 pupils, so there was enough ammunition there to kill every single person in that school. By the time I got to ground, the bullets would have been three feet above me, coming in through the windows. She just said, I don't know how many bodies I've identified, and I just, I just, I couldn't believe what I'd heard. I just thought, she said bodies, and I'm thinking, you know, how many. On the 13th of March, 1996, a man walked into the gym of Dunblane Primary School and shot dead 16 children and their teacher. Eleven other children and three teachers survived horrific injuries. In four minutes, Dunblane had changed forever. Nestling in the shadow of the Highlands, a short commute from Glasgow and Edinburgh, Dunblane has always prided itself on being prosperous, safe and law-abiding. Away from the cities, lots of fresh air, lots of activities for the children to do that were safe. It's just a normal town where folk go about their business without anything major happening most days. It's a church orientated in many ways. We have quite a number of churches. They're mainly all well attended. It keeps the community together. The town's main school, one of the largest in central Scotland, touches the lives of most of the community one way or another. We had two children that time and we didn't think we wanted to bring them up in London. And we felt, you know, Dunblane, the school was nearby and seemed to be lots going on for kids. We needed a bigger house to live in and Dunblane was a very convenient place for us to move to. We knew other families here and the schools had a good reputation. Who would have chosen a place like Dunblane for such a dreadful thing to happen? Nobody in their wildest dreams would have thought that anything like that would have happened in a place like Dunblane. Wednesday the 13th of March was to be a day of unimaginable tragedy. A day that would be remembered with horror all over the world. Eileen Harold taught PE at nine schools in central Scotland. That day she was scheduled to work at Dunblane Primary, the school she'd chosen for her own two younger children. It's been very helpful that in the past ten years there's not really been a morning like that morning because it was snowing that morning in March. And um, it was uh, a case of cleaning the car before I got the children off to school because I took them to school. And the two older boys were dropped at the high school. Jennifer and Jack came with me to the primary school. One of them always carried my bag into the gym for me, and then off they went to their own classes. With Mothering Sunday just a few days away, it was going to be a busy week for Irene Flores, the town's florist and Sunday school teacher. You're sort of preparing, thinking, what do we need from the market tomorrow, etc. You know, making sure you've got enough of everything in the shop for that week. Not a an inkling of anything out of the ordinary. Life was just going on. Folk were walking to work, walking to school, the high school kids were walking up the road. Just a normal day. Since his wife Barbara had died of cancer two years earlier, Mick North had been bringing up their five-year-old daughter alone. We would have woken up sometime between seven and half past seven, got dressed, Sophie 
needed a plaster. I think uh, one of the cats must have just scratched her the day before. We went downstairs, had breakfast. I then drove up the road to the school and dropped her off at Kids Club, where she went every day before school and stayed after school. She was standing on the far side of the, the room at Kids Club, uh, just standing there saying goodbye to me. And um, that's stayed in my mind all the time. With three children at school, I had volunteered to help in the nursery. And March 13th was my, my second morning helping. I had primary ones coming in, and I could hear them in the assembly uh, singing away their hymns as I prepared because there was a big class. They were a particularly beautiful class, actually. They were gorgeous children. They were lots of different individuals, so they weren't. I wouldn't say they were a particularly easy class. You know, they knew what they wanted to do, and uh, they had strong wills, and they were very bright, intelligent, alert, enthusiastic and put all that mix into the melting pot and you've got quite a, a handful of children. At some point they would have changed into their, their, their gym clothes um, before going to assembly. Uh, from assembly they went straight into the gym at uh, half past nine. And the first five little ones ran into the gym full of beans shouting, ah great, you know, there's lots of nice things. But, you know, it's very important that safety was the first, um, ironically safety is the first th thing that you teach them. So they were frog marched out again and made to line up with the rest of them and told that they had to wait until I told them to come in. Nobody is entirely clear which route he used, but it was probably through a side door. He then went to the assembly hall, where the assembly had finished five minutes before, and one shot was fired. He then moved round to the gym which was next door to the asse uh, assembly hall, entered the gym and immediately started firing first at the adults and then at the children. The 13th of March 1996, an unremarkable morning in Dunblane, central Scotland. At Dunblane Primary, the first of the day's lessons was beginning. The large building with the windows and doors facing us was the assembly hall at the time and that's where the primary 1, 2 and 3 assembly would have taken place. Just up from that, where there is now no building connected to it, was the gym at the time. It was a few minutes after 9.30. A class of excited five and six-year-olds was starting a session in the gym. So we'd just started the warm-up and, uh, and that's when it happened literally, I would say, about five minutes into the lesson. Um, I was quite near the door and he came through the door, um, a glass door, just banged the door right open. And from the moment he approached the adults first and he walked towards me and started shooting. He was Thomas Hamilton, a discredited scout leader, harbouring a grudge against a town that no longer let him teach at its boys clubs. My initial reaction was to put my arms up, which is what I did, so that's why I was put, shot through the arms. Um, and um, from then on in, it was rapid fire shooting and killing instantly, instantly. Because after he turned from me, he turned to Gwen, who was sitting at a bench at the back of the gym. And then the other adult, who was a teacher helper, uh, was also shot. And then he targeted the children very close range. In the classroom closest to the gym, a group of 11-year-olds was settling down to a maths lesson. 
you hear bangs, basically. First of all, you're thinking, is this just somebody dropping something? Is somebody playing around with things? But you couldn't believe at first that it would be a somebody shooting. You always had it in the back of your mind that it could be, but it's not the first thing that came to mind. And then just after a couple of minutes of hearing it, we're thinking it's continuing on so long that this is it's more and more likely that that was what it was, gunfire. I knew that there was people dead. Yes, yes, oh yeah. Instantly. Oh yeah. To the side, there was a huge storage area where all the large equipment, mats, etc. were kept. And I somehow managed to realise that that's where we had to make our way to for some shelter. Um, and that's what some of us managed to do, a group of children, Mary and myself, and covered in the floor. Next, Hamilton turned his attention to the primary seven class opposite. Our first reaction when he did come out of the fire exit was, I think it came naturally to us to hit the ground because he's going to be shooting through the windows get down on the floor, but it was the first thing the teacher said, go and get to ground. Hamilton fired nine rounds through the classroom windows, missing Stephen and his classmates by just a few feet. When we were first shot at through the, the windows, you could hear obviously the glass and there was there was glass all over the floor at that point. That, that was the main problem. I mean, okay, bullets had come into the classroom but there was so much more glass coming towards you you were thinking let's try to keep it keep out the way of it and and hide what happens in that situation where you're in a life-threatening situation is some of your senses clamp down but some become so heightened and my sense of hearing was so heightened I was aware although I couldn't actually see him of where he was and what he was doing and I was trying to be proactive and think about how we could protect ourselves and what we could do in that situation. The echo of the gym, the gym had a terrible echo anyway, but it was repeatedly the, the close shots of his gun going off. I was trying to be aware of where he was in the gym. That's what I was trying to do. Where is he? Is he at the top of the gym? Is he coming our way again? Just trying to be aware. Not I really could do anything about it, but just trying to be aware of where he was. If you weren't lying there thinking, why am I going to die? You were thinking more, if he comes into this classroom, what's the fastest way of getting out? And where do we run to? Where can he not find us, for example? I just drove into the car park and I don't know why. I don't know why, but I sensed something was wrong and I didn't know what it was. And there was another parent came up and I remarked to her there's something wrong and she, she, she said yeah, uh, she didn't know what, what it was either. And as I went in, I opened up the nursery door and Mrs. Isles had the children sitting in the corner, um, the story corner, and I knew that was wrong. I mean, that, this was the beginning of nursery, that's what they do at the end of nursery. And Mrs. Isles jumped when I came in and she looked very tense and she said, oh, it's all right, it's just Mrs. Dougherty. And, I th and she said, just hang your coat up over the door. And I thought, there's something wrong, there's something, there's something outside that we're not wanting the children to see. And I just, I just didn't know what it could be. And there was a little boy who kept saying over and over again, what a bad man, he's a bad man, he's a bad man. And we want him to be quiet, be quiet, don't we? Don't make a sound. Um, and eventually he was quiet and uh, and didn't move, lay down, was still. He fired 105 rounds from his pistol in the space of around three minutes.
I think we have to imagine, um, particularly in view of other mass shootings, that his intention was to kill himself and to cause as much mayhem as possible before he did that. Gwen Mayer and 15 children lay dead on the floor of the gym. Another victim was to die on the way to hospital. Eleven more children and three teachers were seriously wounded. One boy alone survived the massacre physically unharmed. One girl was absent. Then everything went silent. There was an eerie silence. He shot himself. And just for, it felt like quite a long time, there was calm, there was silence. And I don't know how long it lasted, whether it lasted just half a minute, whatever. But then people began to react to their injuries. The children started to moan and to cry. And then help came into the gym then. against this background. Reports are coming in that one person is dead and several people have been injured after a shooting incident at Dunkley Primary School. It's understood that a gunman burst into the small primary school in the village... The murderer, who was armed with four handguns, then killed himself. All the children were under six years old. When the phone call came in and said that there had been a shooting at Dunkley Primary School, you know, we didn't believe it at first and then ran into the gym and... We saw the devastation that was there. It was more or less like taking a big deep breath, going into the auto drive and carrying on what we had to do. It was the, the, the children lying on the floor, um, basically looked as if they were sleeping. Um, but, and it, it's the one or two children that we were dealing with in the, in the storeroom kept going back to this one wee boy. I don't know if that was my point of connection, but just kept going back to him to make sure he was okay. Um, and, until such times as we could get an ambulance up to take him away. After the sound of gunfire, confusion and bewilderment, and the anxiety of waiting for news. A stricken crowd of parents waiting in dread to be told who lived and who died. An unreal situation, really. They were screaming from fear and from pain. Strangely enough, I never actually was, although I was aware that I'd been shot, pain wasn't my initial reaction actually. It was a, an awareness of what exactly was happening in the gym because I felt responsible. As the bullet stopped, your mind started to think, we'll survive this, so it's, it's, it's ended. What's that, well, dare I say, what's happened to him? Has he been arrested? What's going on? And also, to an extent, particularly for people like me, and got well, loads of people in my class at that time who had brothers or sisters around the school. Where are they? What's happened to them? There were colleagues knocking on my door, asking if I'd heard that a shooting had been reported at Dunblane Primary School. I hadn't. I tried phoning the police, the line was engaged. I didn't know the school's number off the top of my head, so I didn't phone that. And then somebody offered me a lift, along with another colleague of mine who had a child at the school, and uh, we were driven up to Dunblane. It was only when I arrived there, saw all the hundreds of people milling around in the street. There were roadblocks. They thought, well, this has to be something very serious. It was just awful. They just stood outside in the cold, hundreds of them, and with little information, just watching ambulances and police cars and journalists and really not knowing, um, and rumours going around. And, and even, you know, even though maybe it, it, it was clear that it was one class, you know, People didn't feel they could be sure their children were safe until they actually saw them and held them. I remember thinking at the time, somebody 
I sent their child off to school and probably argued in the morning, as most people do, sent them off to school, which should be a happy and secure place. And, and then that's what happens, that child doesn't come home. You remember it vividly. It's something that you'll never forget. And then step by step, started learning more and started being drawn into what was happening more and more as I found out what class it was, was moved to a house where other parents with children uh, in the class, including friends I, I knew were there. Then we get moved into the staff room and suddenly the pressure feels more and more intense because the odds uh, against it not being a child start um, drifting away and uh, you know that it's her class. Know by then that some children have been killed, some children have been injured. But, not officially. The worst thing was that the police wouldn't tell us anything. In the gym, teachers and police were still struggling to identify all of the victims. I know one, there was one lady who was helping, she came up and when I was in nursery and she asked me if there were any blankets and, and I went to pass her my coat um, and she said afterwards, she said, Nora, when you did that, I thought, I can't take your coat because she knew what would be happening to it, but I didn't know, it. you know, I didn't know that, I just thought it was keeping the child warm. Well, you just switch through all the possibilities. There's the hopeful one, that Sophie's somewhere obviously traumatised, because we were quite aware then that this was not a minor incident, but hopefully unharmed otherwise. Right through to, well, what am I going to do now? She's dead. I was there for over two hours. A team of three people called me out um, with a friend of mine who had stayed with me and they took me to a classroom and that's where they told me that Sophie was one of the children who had been killed. And that's where, for the first time, I heard that it was actually 16 children who had been killed. In 1996, Thomas Hamilton walked unchallenged into Dunblane Primary, carrying guns and enough ammunition to kill every child and teacher in the school. It was literally a lottery as to who lived and who died. It was an absolute lottery because that's something that I've thought, spent a lot of time thinking about. Why did I survive and other people didn't? The assembly hall was empty, so Hamilton showered a class of infants in the gym next door with bullets. Primary one teacher Gwen Mayer and 16 children died. 11 others and three teachers were seriously wounded. I felt relief that not all the children had, had died, because that could easily have happened, and that all of them who survived the first few hours pulled pull through. It didn't matter who you were, where you lived, it just didn't make any difference. On March 13th, we were levelled. Why Dunblane? Why did it happen here? You know, you can imagine it happening in a big city, but not in a place like Dunblane. When I was in hospital at first, the shock of what had happened was the main thing. In my mind, I kept saying, this could not have happened. It wasn't possible to have happened. And the way I dealt with that was, every time I had a visitor, was to tell them what had happened. And I would go through it and go through it and go through it. And it was my way of sort of trying to come to terms that what had actually happened that morning 
uh, in front of my eyes uh, was real, even though I had the physical injuries to show it was real. It was undescribable how distressed we were, and although I was pleased that my children had survived and very, very relieved, I felt guilty because I knew that, you know, other parents were going through what they must be going through. Mick North was still coming to terms with the death of his wife from cancer when their only daughter, five-year-old Sophie, was killed in the gym. It was obviously a very close relationship that we had. She liked drawing, she liked watching videos, um, she liked going to parties and uh, playing in the, in, in the ball pool and various things like that. Um, she liked going swimming. She'd become a very bright, intelligent, talkative, friendly girl and a pleasure to be with. And I know how irrational it is, but you think of all sorts of ways in which she needn't have been there, needn't have moved to Dunblane. Um, um, I couldn't keep her off school, but it still doesn't make you stop feeling guilty. I mean, particularly as I'd made promises to Barbara about making sure Sophie was all right. Deep in shock, this small community became the focus of worldwide attention and overwhelming grief. I never thought of picking up the phone and someone in New Zealand saying, we you put flowers at the school, someone from New York. The messages were terrible to write. There was poems, there was just simple lines, there was obviously folk who'd thought hard and long about it. I still got a lot of the messages to this day. I have a folder with all this stuff in it and I can't bear to throw it out. But I don't open it up. I don't, it's there, but I don't look at it now. I didn't see the flowers until the day of Sophie's funeral. And I went back to the house where other people uh, who'd been to the funeral had um, congregated. And I just couldn't stay there, so uh, an old school friend of mine who travelled up and I went out for a walk. And I think I must have been aware that there were flowers, but we just came upon them as we were walking along Dune Road outside the school. And I was very mixed, very mixed feelings just to think that those were there, partly because my daughter had been killed. It was also a strange feeling going up to the cemetery because after a few days the flowers were transferred from the street up to the cemetery. And it was quite windy, I think, the first time I went up there and there was a field of cellophane flowers and they were rustling. And sometimes when I go to the cemetery now and there's just one bouquet of flowers somewhere and you hear that rustle, that brings that, that back. There were gifts to children who were no longer there to enjoy the gifts. You know, teddy bears should be given to children to play with, not leading their memory outside a school that they've went to school with. The weekend after the massacre was Mothering Sunday, but for the parents and the children of Dunblane, it was now a day of silence and of sorrow. It was hard going back into the Sunday school afterwards because there was missing children and to go into the cupboard and find things that they had done. Um, they had been getting ready for Mother's Day. We do celebrate it for doing things at the Sunday school and you went back and the stuff was in the cupboard because it never got there.
Nine days after the killings, the children of Dunblane went back to school. What was really important, actually, that I felt, I think we all felt that, you know, that bastard wasn't going to get us down. He wasn't going to get us as well. It was a hugely powerful feeling that recovery was really important because he'd taken enough lives and ruined them. He wasn't going to take ours as well. At the start of the day that you went back, it was in your mind, could it happen again? And I think, yeah, I could have been dead. I could have been, from my point of view, far more seriously injured. This has been a, a long, dark week, full of tears. Dunblane is uh, still in mourning. However, the evil that came last week is gone. The children return to school today. And this is a, a very important day for us because today marks the beginning of our recovery. And you mark my words, we will recover. I promise you that. A first step in that long and difficult process was the demolition of the gym where Hamilton had committed his murders. By now, the families of the victims of Dunblane were meeting regularly and beginning to ask some pressing questions about the man who had killed their children and why he was licensed to carry guns. When I found out that everything he had done until he pointed that gun and, hit the, and fired at me initially because I took the first shot was legal. Everything he'd done, in other words, he'd practiced his massacre. I was furious. I was, I had never seen a gun in my life before. I knew nothing about gun control. But when I found out that, then that made me so angry that there was no way that we would let this rest. Hamilton, a gun enthusiast, was well known to the police in Dunblane. A number of complaints had been made about his supervision at local boys' clubs. Questions had also been raised as to his suitability to hold a gun license. How does society deal with somebody who is on the margins but has never committed a, 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 a crime that can be actually seen by the legal system as, as a crime? It was a paradox that had cost Sophie North her life. Eileen Harold was the first person called to give evidence at Lord Cullen's public inquiry, which opened that May. That was one of the most difficult things I had to do in my life, actually. One of the most difficult mornings of my life. Because they wanted to know what had happened, and I had to... Well, they knew what had happened, but I had to give evidence. And I tried to give it in such a way that there was no more hurt. They didn't they get any more hurt than they already were. Um, and it was a very difficult morning. At the time, I was probably glad that it was going to happen sooner or than later. I have changed my mind on that. I think it happened far too quickly. Uh, we didn't have time to appreciate the, the, the evidence that was going to be um, presented. Um, and it was done at a time when we were all extremely raw. Even before the Cullen Inquiry had begun, a group of local parents and their friends had launched a campaign of their own for a total ban on the private ownership of handguns. The snowdrop campaign, of course, is named after the only flower out that morning. That time in March was a snowdrop, and it's such a delicate flower. It was a perfect name for this campaign, symbolic of the children, you know, fragile, helpless. And that was started very quickly afterwards with that simple aim of banning all handguns. By July... Over 700,000 signatures had been raised and a group of us, Snowdrop campaigners and families, took the petition to Parliament and were able to meet a number of senior politicians uh, at that time. 
School security was tightened, but Lord Cullen's limited recommendations on gun control disappointed the Snowdrop campaigners. I did have a role to play, whether I liked it or not, because I was a class teacher at that time, and I had to take my, take my place in this campaign. And we weren't going to rest until that situation was changed, and nothing like this could ever happen again. The deaths of their children had turned the parents and their fellow campaigners of Dunblane into a potent political force. His earmuffs served a dual purpose, to lessen the noise of gunshot, but also to block out a noise he would not have been used to on the target range, the screams of terrified infants. 17 dead, 14 injured, and one child who stood and watched it all. Within 24 months, they had achieved their objective, some of the tightest legislation on handguns in the world. When you look at the picture, the characteristics of the child, you remember. You know, some were very quiet, and others were very boisterous, and you, and you do, you look and look at them and sort of see in their eyes, you know, the child that they were, and probably the adult they would have become. I always think it must be so hard for the parents who lost children to see the child growing up who survived. And I met one other day and said, hello, and I went, hello, and the voice was way down low, and you think, my goodness, that's them really becoming, you know, men now, they're going to adulthood. And I think that's when you realise 10 years has passed and they were just five, they were just babies, really. What I'll be doing in that day is exactly what I've done really for every other anniversary, you know, the same pattern. I make up little poses for each child. So some like white flowers and some like yellow or whatever. And we take them to the, the cemetery. The anniversary is a very poignant time, very sad time. Time to remember and reflect. Here's uh, Sophie in her school uniform and uh, you can see she's very proud of this and uh, she was really looking forward to uh, going to the primary school. Six months after starting school, Sophie North was dead, one of 16 children killed along with their form teacher, Gwen Mayer, in the shootings at Dunblane Primary. What she would have been like is intriguing, and I don't often ask myself that question. The memories of her at age five are still so fresh in my mind that they would rather obscure the guessing game of what she would be age 15. The theme of the window is out of darkness and into light. The children are represented by little doves and each dove has a flower in its mouth and each flower is, represents the child. They're linked together by a daisy chain and they're led by Gwen as she might have called them out in class. The snowflakes are symbols of the children and the teachers who were injured in the gym and as they fall to the ground the symbol of the tragedy which is the snowdrop begins to grow and that represents the injured as they get stronger year on year both physically and emotionally. Eileen Harold was shot four times trying to shield herself and the children from Hamilton's bullets. She needed five operations to rebuild her shattered arms. There's no prescription, I don't think, for dealing with grief. Everybody dealt with it in their own way. And I 
think as a community actually that people have moved forward and that's with great respect to what has happened and remembering um, the children obviously but um, we've actually it's a very positive thing to move on and it's a very healthy thing to do it would not be good to, to remain in the past A new generation of primary school children is growing up in Dunblane. The town is moving on, but will never forget. Everybody felt the same that day, and I think we built on that, really. I think that the barriers went down, and hopefully, you know, they've, they've stayed down, or certainly, you know, there's, there's not this in us and them, maybe that you do get in some other areas. Nora left her part-time job as a nursery assistant. She's been one of the volunteers who planned Dunblane's Youth and Community Centre, a £2 million project financed out of donations which poured into the town. I see the centre now as a gift that was given and it's a loving tribute to the children and it's also a tribute to the kindness that was shown to Dunblane at that time. A picture was placed in a window for each of the children killed. For Sophie North, her cat. Um, I'm being squashed by a Kit Kat at the moment and the, uh, this is Rosie. Both names were given by Sophie, and uh, she would give them both very affectionate, over affectionate perhaps, cuddles, particularly to Kit Kat. It is important that the children of Dunblane do have suitable facilities for activities, and at the moment it will be many of Sophie's contemporaries who will be getting the benefits from their centre and I think that is appropriate. Stephen Hopper was in primary seven at the time of the massacre. His teacher ordered the class onto the floor just seconds before Hamilton fired a volley of bullets above their heads. I think it's certainly driven my interest in primary school teaching. It's made me or it certainly influenced my realising how much responsibility there is in that job and what you have to take responsibility for. After Sophie's murder, Mick North decided to give up his career as a university lecturer. He went on to campaign for tighter gun controls. I think it's important that uh, people are aware of the tragedy that hit Dunblane in 1996. But also to know that in, in the aftermath, a lot of things were achieved. Some lessons have been learnt, I think. Guns are very dangerous in private hands and should therefore be uh, appropriately regulated. Don't make guns easily available to people. Mick North has moved out of Dunblane away from the family home he shared with his wife and daughter. I think you can never draw a line under something like this, both as an individual who's suffered personal loss, but also the country, the community, mustn't draw lines under this. I, I, we can't just uh, set it aside as something in the past and, and not think about the significance of it. I think it's important for people to know that Victims and their families, the families of the bereaved, do live on, do live important, meaningful lives in which things can still be achieved. They're not totally wrecked. But that doesn't mean that they don't relive what happened every day. I've always sort of likened it to walking along a parallel path to the one you would have taken before. Um, but you don't stop walking, you don't stop doing things. In the memorial garden, the children's graves are arranged in two neat rows. 
a silent classroom. Gwen Mayer, their teacher, lies by their side. I don't feel bitter. Actually, I've always just felt, having had a huge roller coaster of emotions, from anger to questioning, why did I survive? But overwhelmingly, it's just an aching sadness for the loss of such beautiful children.